Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Guernsey's had a pretty interesting auction last week. The first day, July 14th, there wasn't much to look at. That is, not unless you were interested in more classical-styled instruments like violins and mandolins and a whole bunch of other stuff. Maybe a couple of banjos, cellos, things like that. The most interesting ones I saw were this strange practice violin. I guess you could call this the flying eye. <laughs> I would have bought that for 300 bucks if it was functional, just because it's kind of strange. And then you have the exact opposite of that. They call it a pochette violin. As a violin player, uh, I'm not quite sure. Where, where did your chin rest go? <laughs> I'd have to do some reading into what that one's for. And lastly, I thought this one was funny because if you ever thought of like a ripoff violin, this is exactly what I would think. Doesn't have all those nice fine points like this one has right here. I mean, just look at them compared side by side. I'm sure the sound's slightly different, but it just looks strange. But no, 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 day two is where all the good stuff was. I mean, sure, there's some memorabilia stuff, but we've got about 30 guitars that we'll look at today. Some of them are really cool because they're vintage masterpieces. Other ones, it's just to laugh at them that they didn't sell. So our first one here is a 1956 Gibson L7C. So L7, despite being a bigger number than an L5, is actually ranked below that if I understand it correctly. And C stands for a cutaway, which you can see right here. I don't know about you guys, but 3000 bucks seems extremely cheap for one of these old archtop guitars. Was there something wrong with it? Yeah, there was something wrong with it. Look at that, the binding has just completely come off. Now, thankfully, that is a very easy fix. You just glue it, clamp it, usually you're good, unless it's too brittle to fix. But somebody definitely used a pick while playing this. It's just a well-loved guitar. It doesn't even look like it came stock from the factory with a pick guard. That's kind of cool. Oh wait, never mind. I think I see it right there. So besides needing some TLC, was there anything else wrong with this one? Whoa, whoa, holy cow. I've never, ever seen a back that nice on one of these arch tops. Jeez. Like, I've seen them nicely figured and whatnot, but not like that. Holy cow. I don't care how much work this thing needed. I really regret not looking at this auction. That is something to be proud of if you have that. Because not only do you have the really wide ribbon flame that I love, you got the wood grain behind that. Sure, it's all beat up and scratched up, but that thing has character. And it even comes with the pick guard. Looks like a couple of lines along the neck. Maybe it needs a reset or it had a reset. I don't care because that back is just fantastic. And that looks like a, a 90s era case with purple interior. Cool. Oh, and what's even better, it was a one-family owner, purchased brand new by the father of the current owner. So technically, two owners, but within the original family, okay. Now you need to remember, there's a 25% buyer's premium on top of what it sold for. So it really sold for just under 4000 at $37.50. But heck, even at that price, if I would have saw that, I would have bought it. Fantastic find. Next up, we have a 65 Fender Jazz Bass. Once again, another well-loved instrument. It's like turned green down here. There's just so much play wear and sweat absorbed into the finish. Kind of disgusting if you really think about it. But a very vibrant red pick guard on there. You still have your thumb rest, the giant bridge cover, and the pickup cover. Normally those things are lost, but I love the look of those. You even have a strap button in the headstock right there. That's a pretty cool find. But that ended up selling for 6000 well under their estimate of ten to $20,000. you will see that quite a bit in this auction. And this one is a 1952. The 52 market's kind of interesting because it keeps going up. This one sold for 14000 so when you add the buyer's premium, I would consider that a very fair price. What was going on with this one? It looks, you know, fairly well worn in. It's got the finished checking that people like. Oh, that's special. You have original owner photos. I always love seeing, you know, guitars in these old style photos. I mean, I guess you could technically fake these photos. They have filters out there. So maybe this is real. Maybe it's not. That'd be pretty dubious of someone to do. <laughs> 
just a fake and old timey photo shoot. I mean, I'm sure there's houses that still look like this with flower wallpaper everywhere. But just a glimpse into the past of this guitar. There's always people saying, oh, I wish I could know all the stories this instrument had. And that would be cool. But other than photos like that one, you generally can't know what this guitar has seen. And that's the beauty of vintage guitars. Whoa, <laughs> moldy Swiss cheese is what I would nickname this one. <laughs> I like that. Maybe add burnt to that title as well. But this is one of the nicest looking 52s I've seen if you like the whole aged greenness with a whole lot of finish checking, but not like a lot of green in the arm areas. It's just the finish checked areas that have turned green. Looks like it has had a refret though. Man, they even have a nice little story about how an 11 year old boy from Tennessee got this by taking several years of $5 a month payments before he could own it himself. Those are just those golden stories. It ended up selling for well under their estimate, but I still think they got a fair price for it given the condition and it being a 52. Next up, I wanted to share this because what on earth? 1962 <laughs> Stratic. This looks like some weird parallel alternate reality universe type thing where they've got like a swamp green kind of transparent black body but then you've got a tom morello style mirror pick guard on here but single coil in the neck single coil in the bridge but then yes please i would just like a humbucker in the middle i don't think i've ever seen that configuration exactly like this like maybe a stacked pickup but not just a straight up humbucker in the middle and on top of that we get two little switches right here with our regular controls they still even after all these modifications have the bridge cover now that seems suspicious to me <laughs> Nobody ever keeps the Stratocaster ones. It's been upgraded with a brass nut. This is one freaky looking guitar. It's like a swamp monster. What? Excuse me? Oh boy. Okay, so normally these have a route like this. The route has been extended. Do they have fancy electronics in this thing? They better not. They better not. Apparently it was used on the motels. I'm not familiar with that band or album. So maybe there is a bit more of a history behind that. Well, unfortunately, besides telling us his life story of how he lost use of one of his arms, they didn't tell me about any of these fancy electronics or why they would enlarge that back. That'd be interesting to see, but I love that rosewood fretboard with this combination of colors. Kind of cool. At 8,500 bucks, it sold for well under their estimate, but not being familiar with that artist, I, I would say they got a fair price in my opinion. Next up here, a Martin 1936 D28 sold for a staggering $55,000, but well below their estimate. I don't know enough about Martins to even comment. I just know this is old and Martin is a very well respected brand. So we'll just casually take a look at this in case you're a Martin fan. On to the next one. Okay, so this ES330 was very interesting. From far away, I thought it was like maybe pinstriped in a unique way, but now that I'm seeing it up close, now this thing was just molested with a whole bunch of signatures. So it looks like it says, thanks Musictron, and then it's signed by a whole bunch of guys. So we've got Greg Martin. I see Ted Nugent right here, potentially. Is that Peter Green? Paul Gilbert? I'm not sure. Looks like maybe Michael Stern. I mean, I like these iconic artists as much as anyone else, but did we really have to ruin a beautiful vintage 330 for this? <laughs> I mean, I get it when you do this on like a brand new guitar for like a charity auction, but on a vintage piece, maybe this was, I guess this was done in 1991. So the vintage craze wasn't quite at its peak yet. So maybe this was a slightly less expensive guitar at that point in time, or it's just what somebody had to donate. I mean, it wasn't 100% original. You could see the lines around here, which either show somebody was careless with their strings tuning them. You can see how it kind of pokes out right there. Or somebody put a giant washer on here and they had like a Grover's on at one point in time. This looks like just string damage to me. So maybe it was original. 
Well, how much did this butchered example sell for? 3,250 bucks. And that's a 60s instrument as well. Let's see, what do they say? Looks like there was the Steve Miller Band, Cool and the Gang, Count Basie Orchestra. I'm surprised they didn't mention Ted Nugent. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's not his signature. I guess now that I look at it closer, no, that doesn't look like it at all. I suppose I can see why they didn't sell for a whole bunch of money. Next up, a sweet 350T. Chuck Berry signature that we did. That was a fantastic guitar. It just recently sold. I shipped it off to its new home and he was thrilled with that thing. I remember enjoying it a lot. Now this vintage example, it's got some okay flying. Decent figuring. Not the best I've ever seen. Not exactly the worst. Just kind of depends at the angle. But this thing actually sold for a surprising amount. $11,000 plus the buyer's premium. They definitely fit well within the estimate. And I think that Chuck Berry reissue helped the vintage ones go up in value a little bit because they didn't used to sell for quite that much. Next up, we just have a sweet jazz master from 1960. Looks like it sold a little under 5,000 bucks. That seems okay to me, but I don't really follow the vintage market. This, this guitar looks right to me. Like I'm not in love with the finish, but that headstock is beautiful. That giant logo that says Jazz Master. I'm so used to the modern day ones where it's so, so tiny. I like it when you got the big old wispy winds. And this thing was definitely played in the cowboy chord positions. Here's one of those lots just to laugh at. <laughs> Stella Silvertone Harmony. These are the guitars you see in pawn shops all the time and people buy them, they think, oh yeah, I just found this vintage guitar, it's worth so much money, I'm gonna sell it, but first I need to get it appraised so I know what to sell it for, and then they go, sorry, yeah, it's old, but it's not that desirable, they're not worth that much money, but they sure do look cool. The starting bid was 750 for all three of those guitars, and nobody placed a single bid. Not that hard to see why. Next up, Bad Axe Lucy Blues Folk Art Guitar. Nobody wanted this either. <laughs> when we say our guitars are axes, we, we don't mean literal axes, but you know, that would be an interesting headstock design for someone. Have an axe head for your headstock. You could get away with it with like the Steinberger tuners without having a, a crazy angle on your nut. I'm sure it's been done before, but this was never meant to be a functional piece. Okay, next, we've got Chick Corea's silver Yamaha guitar. I thought it was cool. Destroyed all estimates, and he had like two or three of these, and they all sold for around the same price. Guitars are just cool, man. <laughs> and you get a nice little signed photo of him there, too. This Chet Atkins was a single owner guitar that sold for 6500 JC Buchanan. Just kind of a cool Gretsch. I don't know a lot to comment. I've had a few Gretches on the channel now, like you can check out the White Penguin if you're interested. And I would check out more. Kind of a similar story on this one, a Super 400. You know, I've talked about Super 400s quite often on the channel because of the origination of the Super 400 inlays that are used on Les Paul sometimes. And that's, you know, where you get this big old truss rod and this cool looking headstock. They're giant headstocks, though. And they get the giant Cluson Seal Fast tuners. Why does everybody take those pick guards off? The pick guards make these arch tops to me. Oh, and who can forget the beautiful Stinger? And yes, I love the inlays on the back of the headstock. That's called being fancy for the sake of being fancy. Not everyone sees that except for you. Next up, we had a cheap trick autographed Epiphone Flying V. I was more so concerned of the safety of this Flying V that it was pink and had what looks like active humbuckers and some sort of a trem system put on it. It's kind of cool. Cheap trick aside, it kind of reminded me of that breast cancer awareness guitar that I reviewed one time. Oh, <laughs> I could have helped but not get a good chuckle out of this. A cold play, pair of painted guitars. Nobody wanted it. Looks like they were custom painted. They're kind of cool, but I think the opening bid was around 3,000 bucks. I guess it depends what these guitars are. Are they even real fenders? Oh, whoa. 
Tokai. Okay. That threw me for a loop from far away. It looked like it said Fender. Yeah, and this other one, that's that's an import model. I can see why they didn't sell, and it's not just because of the artist. But this one, Peter Green's Les Paul guitar. Do you guys see what this is? This was an opportunity to pay about double market value for a guitar that Peter Green used of a rare Les Paul Firebrand. All things considered, if you're a big fan of Peter Green, I don't think this should have not sold. I mean, it wasn't advertised correctly. This is a Firebrand, part of the, the Paul series. And it appears it's all original. It doesn't look to be in that bad a shape. Unfortunately, it's not one of the factory relic versions. Those are kind of cool, but it's hard to find just a straight up fire brand that doesn't have that. But I was birthed in 1980, appears to have pretty much all the original parts. Okay, it was played. You can see the finish wear right here. Holy cow, they estimated it to seven and 10? I don't think they did their research to figure out what kind of Les Paul that was. Maybe you'll see it get relisted if you're interested. Next up, we had a Paul McCartney J45. This one also did not get any bids, surprisingly enough, at 5,000. Even his SG didn't sell. Now, this looks like a, a 1970 to me, so those aren't the most valuable of the vintage SGs by any means, but that, that didn't seem that overpriced for what it is. I mean, sure, it's got replaced tuners, but it still looks great. Did it have some sort of a, a repair? I mean, it's not in the best of condition. I'm not seeing the typical telltale signs of heel repairs. Hmm. All I know is that is a mighty fine looking SG. And if it was Paul McCartney's, that's just kind of cool. Okay, maybe it wasn't his. It was just used by him at one point in time for one of his album recordings in 2012. Okay, maybe they're just kind of stretching this name a little bit on these. Next up, we had a couple of Jason Becker's guitars. I mean, when I told you in the title that this auction brought out the hefty pocket guys, it brought out the hefty pocket guys. Estimated between fifty dollars to $100,000, it sold for $85,000. Nice. You can read about the story of this now defunct Hurricane Guitars right here. But this was like going to be a signature guitar for Jason Becker. And it appears you can actually see it right here on an album. No wonder it sold for so much. This is definitely an iconic piece for certain people that like this part of history. But the one that he's mainly known for is his numbers guitar. And this one brought 65,000. So on the lower end of their estimates. The first time I actually saw this guitar, was a guy was teaching lessons on YouTube with it. And I was like, you know, that is a beautiful way to teach guitar lessons. Cause then if people are like, what fret is he on? Okay, 16th, okay, 20th. <laughs> It'd make it really easy. I wouldn't mind reviewing one of these one day, even though I don't really like the tremolo systems. It was just a very interesting guitar. And if I'm understanding this auction correctly, this is one of his personal ones. So hopefully all this money's going towards helping him and wasn't just somebody reselling it after buying it. I'm not sure. Because they also did the Blue Hurricane guitar at 80,000 bucks. Kind of a 24 fret super strat slanted EVH style type thing going on here with the on and off switches. And that's another one that you can see on an album. Continuing on with legendary guitars, here is Bo Diddley's personal 1957 Gretsch Jet Firebird? <laughs> is that what it's actually called? Got destroyed in the estimate category. I mean, it still sold for a respectable 24,000 bucks. Okay, I don't think the bridge is supposed to be quite that slanted, but I don't know, maybe it is. <laughs> Probably that way for intonation reasons. Okay. Yeah, that would actually look pretty halfway decent, I would think, with the black back. But the top looks much cleaner than the back. And probably the most expensive guitar out of this whole auction was Eddie Van Halen's Striper Kramer guitar. So this was the fourth of his handmade guitars that he made himself in 1984 at the Kramer factory. And since Eddie's no longer with us, his guitars are just exploding in value. I mean, 120,000 bucks for this. I'm sure most people would like a small house instead of this guitar, but it definitely is a part of Eddie Van Halen history. 
And hey, if you happen to have missed it, I did review his striped guitar that you can check out right here. Man, and after you add in the buyer's premium on that, holy cow, almost 150,000. Just barely hit their estimate. Seems like this auction place tries to overshoot their estimates. And here was kind of a cool one as well. One of Alan Collins's Firebirds. So it's not like his main one if you read through here, but it was briefly used by him before he switched over to the Explorer. But what's kind of cool about this Firebird is you've got the original Firebird mini hum in the neck, but then take a look at that. That's pretty cool. A dog ear chrome covered P90, yes please. <laughs> but further on, they've swapped out the bridge for an intonatable one and we still have our teaspoon vibrola on there. And it looks like they said, hey, I don't want those controls. Let's just get rid of those and just have a master volume, master tone potentially. That's a pretty cool Firebird here. And you can actually watch him play Freebird on it if you click on these links and take a look at the videos, as you can see him right here. And this particular one was used on some very iconic songs and their concerts. So it definitely didn't get as much as they wanted, but that is very respectable for a modified Firebird. And whoa, I don't remember seeing this one before. So Eric Clapton's personal 1999 Gibson Les Paul Standard sold for a staggering $30,000. Like, even if that was a historic, it just doesn't make sense without Eric Clapton's name on it. But that is the very top of their estimates. What is this thing? First off, you can tell Mr. Clapton got his pick of the best tops in the world because that is fantastic, especially for a 1999, but yes, this is some sort of a reissue. I suppose it makes sense that it was a 1999, 1959 reissue. Okay, so normally I would think maybe, you know, with a monster top like this, maybe, you know, four and a half to 5,000, and that's pushing it for one that's that old. So six times premium for Eric Clapton's name on it. Looks like this one is initially purchased at a Christie's auction and is now being resold here. So I don't know if he made money on that or not, despite us talking about big money. <laughs> and whoa, Eddie Vedder concert used Gibson guitar. 30,000, geez, that just broke all estimates. So another one that was initially found at a charity auction, but is used at a 2014 Pearl Jam tour. Okay, Pearl Jam, all makes sense now. But this, it's kind of a rare guitar. It's part of an anniversary run. Pete Townsend has a, a signature guitar within this, but it was done up in 2011 for a 50 year anniversary of the actual SG. There were a few different models that had this headstock style on it, not just this particular one. And I've got three more for you today. So this is the Joe Perry signature Gibson Les Paul. I have had videos on these before, but they're very old, not the best in quality but this is the studio variant. So the studios actually have a built-in wah circuit. Unfortunately, every time I get one that's been either taken out or is just broken. It's like the Sully Les Pauls. Check out this review and demo. People always take the fancy electronics out of that one too. <laughs> but this one, it, it, it's not the best top in the world, but appears to be in okay shape. It's definitely been used, got nicks and dings. There is a custom shop version of this guitar which sells for crazy money because you just never see it show up. And when you do, it's always the same one that's had a headstock repair, whether they tell you about it or not. But I guess now that I'm seeing it in this lighting, this was definitely heavily used. And typically these things will not bring, you know, more than like 15, maybe 2250 at the very max if it was like super clean. They're not that expensive guitar, so the fact that it sold for that, yeah, I mean, that's just about right, seeing as there doesn't appear to be anything fancy or special about that one. And then we had some sort of a, a Les Paul ripoff signed by Paul McCartney, which still somehow brought in 1700 bucks. And to end things out, the most hilarious thing ever. <laughs> guitar signed by Paul McCartney again. They... Did they really, did they really think a Daisy Rock guitar would sell for 20,000? <laughs> you can check out this. I've done Daisy Rock guitars before. They birthed the infamous Powerpuff Girls guitar, which are fantastic. But at the end of the day, they're not meant to be high-end custom shops. So this guitar right here, 
may be worth 150 bucks. It just all comes down to the people who happen to have signed this pretty pink guitar. Needless to say, I'm not surprised nobody bid. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed taking a look at this auction results with me. Some kind of cool guitars, other ones are just fun to laugh at, but I hope you enjoyed all the same. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.